before giving the uh, moderatorship to uh, our friends Wilco Poil, uh, I want to thank all the participants and also all the speakers for this uh, very nice occasion. Yes, Wilco, uh, you can you can moderate the meeting. to be. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> no well, problem. Thank you very much, uh, Mehmet, and uh, also for all your work uh, for this Spice Society. And I think we have a very special webinar now because most of us are quite curious what to know about the current advances in interoperative neural monitoring. Um, so besides Francesco, who is a neurosurgeon, and uh, I already know for many years, he, uh, when we were young, he already told me how to use spinal cord monitoring. We also have uh, two guests uh, with neurophysiology and neurology uh, background. And um, I hope that uh, we have a nice hour of discussion, but also to know a little bit more, have some more knowledge about the techniques and the advances in uh, interoperative neural monitoring. And um, we will start, I think, Mehmet, with uh, Professor Elif Ilgas Ajinlar. And I think if I did read it well in your curriculum vitae, you are a neurologist. I'm a neurologist. Yes. And I think you also work together with Professor Alanai. So, yes. Uh, yes. So, and Professor Alanai. Yeah, I'm monitoring his cases. Uh, Wonderful. And Professor Alanai is the current president of Eurospine. Uh, and as you might know, that ENS and Eurospine are working together, and Mehmet is responsible for the worldwide spine organization. So you will introduce us in uh, the basics for interoperative spinal cord electrophysiology. So I give the word to you. Maybe Thank you, you very much, Dr. Pearl. Um, let me share my... Uh, I can't share my screen right now. Uh, can you... Give me the position of the host so that I can share. Uh, I'm thrilled to be uh, here and uh, able to share the basic knowledge of interpretive neurophysiology. Uh, Francesco, I know very well for many years, uh, we uh, have worked together at the International Society of Interpretive Neurophysiology, and he's a very important mentor to me, so it's a pleasure for me to be uh, here with him to be able to talk about interpretive neurophysiology. Interpretive spinal cord electrophysiology is very essential in uh, spine and spinal cord surgeries to monitor and preserve spinal cord function. Interpretive multimodal neuromonitoring, we mean multimodal combining different methods together to assess functional integrity of the lateral and the dorsal column of the spinal cord. Our main goal is to not only recognize, but also to prevent neurological damage. Iatrogenic injury can be caused by surgical distraction, compression, ischemia, and there are also systemic or anesthetic causes. Again, ischemia, hypoxia, hypothermia, cervical extension during intubation. And of course, when the patient is put into a prone position, the neck and shoulder can cause direct compression on the nerve or compromise the blood supply. Yatrogenic neurological injuries in elective spinal surgery without neurophysiological monitoring in scoliosis correction can cause a deficit up to 3.2%. In intramedullary tumor resection, this number goes higher up to 24% and rare, but it can still happen. In anter anterior cervical discectomy, we can see 0.46% of um, deficits. So why is this so important? We want to reduce human suffering afterwards. Life expectancies for persons with spinal cord injury continue to increase, but are still uh, very low regarding quality of life. Here is a statistics from the American National Spinal Cord Center. Employment prior injury 
uh, is around uh, 60%, and after such a spinal cord injury, it goes down to 11.5%. So patients with those type of injuries loses their jobs and continue to function in their daily lives. We want to improve or at least maintain the quality of life. People with spinal cord injury report lower sense of well-being scores, lower scores of physical, mental, and social health domain. So why do we consider OEM? We want to improve the patient safety and reduce neurological risks. It has high sensitivity and specificity. That means low false negative and false positive rates. It had tissue injury in a time interval where we still have time for therapeutic interventions. And IOM allows us to precisely locate some specific neural structures. And we can also, most of the time, predict the short and long-term clinical outcomes of the patients. Here is a, a statistics of a nationwide national inpatient sample from the US. These low-risk surges, we mean spinal decompression and spinal fusion, still carry a risk of neurological injuries. And if we compare the cases with the non-IOM with the IOM cases, still neurological complications without performed uh, without IOM are higher than with IOM. Of course, the total hospitalization charges go higher when you use IOM, but we should look at the long-term follow-up physical rehabilitation, and other surgeries to correct the problems. Here is a multi-center database of 50,000 patients. And index surgery, as before, I mentioned before, with patients with IOM costs slightly higher, $1,500, higher than non-IOM cases. But IOM helped to reduce hospital length stay, lesser ICU days, smaller number of surgery-related complications and reoperations. If we look at the graphic, we can see patients in uh, orange color with IOM have postoperative minimal or moderate neurological impairment, while patients with non-OM also have a bad bound state or have severe outcome. When do we need IOM in spinal surgeries, in scoliosis, in fractures, in extramedullary tumors, intramedullary spinal cord tumors, spinal endovascular procedures, cervical myelopathy, lumbar stenosis and fusion surgery, surgery for thatched cord syndrome and other cord equina lesions, dorsal root entry zone procedures and other surgeries for pain. There are relative contraindications, although it's not a mask, and it just, it's not always the case that we uh, abort IOM, but in epilepsy and skull defects and elevated intracranial pressure, we are more careful. In cardiac diseases, especially patients with pacemaker, uh, sometimes we don't prefer to use IOM, especially motor work potentials. And again, in implanted biomedical devices, we might have some difficulties. But the main difficult part is if the patient has preoperative severe deficit, it's not a good candidate for IOM, practically thinking, if the patient is not able to elevate the legs and from their bed, uh, most probably we won't be able to elicit any motor or potentials. So we have two main techniques in IOM for spinal and spinal cord surgeries, the non-provoked and the provoked one. Non-provoked means we're just watching. We're watching the electromyography, the electroencephalography, and don't use any stimulation. If we stimulate the patient with trigger EM, we use trigger MG, somatosensor evoke potentials, transcranial motor evoke potentials, and interpretive nerve conduction studies. If we talk about the provoked one, we're using continuous neuromonitoring. It allows us to monitor the spinal cord function and the motor nerve, continuous motor nerve route continuously during patient positioning during the surgical approach while the muscle is dissected, discectomy, interpodic cage implantation, and entire hardware installation, and during the tumor removal. There are different ion modalities we want to combine together because we want to see whatever we can see, uh, all the neural pathway. So somatosensory work potentials and transcranial motor work potentials are combined together. 
This is the setup in our OR room of the IOM team. We are using subdermal lead electrodes and place them in the target muscles. Corkscrew electrodes, uh, we have placed them in the scalp. Above the somatosensory and motor uh, cortex, we are using a 1020 EEG system to um, locate the spots where the motor and sensor cortex might be. And that we are provoking, we are stimulating the patient and there's a um, jaw movement and body movement. We might endure, we might cause some um, uh, bite injuries in the mouth. So in order to prevent that, we are using gauzes, we roll them and put them between uh, two dental arcs. Transcranial motor potentials are electrical signals we are generating by the muscles in response to stimulation of the motor cortex using transcranial electrical stimulation. We are delivering them through our corkscrew electrodes. We are using commonly the interhemispheric montage. That means uh, we are using, on the right side, we have a scheme. Uh, they, these two schemes are quite equally effective. Uh, some clinics use the left one, some the right one. So we are stimulating on those locations and to left side to right or right side to left side, C1, C2, and C3, C4. Um, C1, C2 is local, more local, and it doesn't um, evoke uh, that much patient movement, but with C3, C4, we have uh, sometimes we use this montage much more because the patient has already some deficits and we want to elicit a stronger current. We are using a pulse ray method to overcome the depressing effect of anesthesia and facilitate the motor walk potentials. We are recording both upper and lower limb MEPs. And we deliver the stimulation anodal from the scalp and the cortex. And we're using the cathodal stimulation when we are in the subcortical area usually in brain tumor surgeries. And uh, if you have a spinal cord tumor, intermediary tumor, we are, uh, can place an epidural, subdural electrode, a catheter electrode, to directly uh, monitor the spinal motor work potentials directly from the spinal cord, which is a great method. And if you can um, elicit this D-wave, uh, you can uh, tightly follow up the intermedullary tumor resection. There are many advantages of the tra uh, transcranial motor potentials. They provide real-time feedback on the functional integrity of the motor pathways, and it quickly aids also to detect spinal cord ischemia. These advantages are that it requires TIVA anesthesia uh, with profitable anesthesia. It can provoke seizures, and there might be some false positive results and we, it causes unnecessary interruption of the surgery. The patient can move, we can still uh, adjust the movement, but still the, it, that's a problem in many cases, and we can cause bite injuries. In limitations in the spinal cord or spine surgery is that motor work potentials are inadequate to detect single root injury and if the patient has preoperative severe deficit and sometimes not able to elicit. Here is a study where we can see the value of transcranial motor work potentials in detecting spinal cord ischemia. After a cross clamping during thoracic abdominal aneurysm repair, the motor work potentials immediately amplitude decline. Uh, and this gives us an idea that there's a problem. So there is an immediate feedback from the motor walk potentials if there is an ischemia in the spinal cord. This is our patient. Unfortunately, uh, uh, she had a bite injury after a, um, a spine surgery. In her first uh, surgery, where it was not done in our center, she already has experienced some um, tongue bite, and uh, therefore we were very cautious. We placed uh, gauge in between both arcs and inspected the mouth and uh, tried to be very careful. But during the surgery with the C1, C2 montage, which uh, causes lesser bite injuries, we were not able to elicit any motor work potentials at all. So we went to C3, C4, where there was more jaw movement and that was the result. We couldn't prevent her bite injury. After, and of course the ENT uh, team came in and they uh, put her into a, they uh, continued and sued the tongue. 
And uh, after eight, nine months, she had she had an accident and she um, had a fracture in her spine and were reoperated. Of course, of this um, experience, we wanted to prevent we wanted to prevent this um, bite injury, and we asked the dental team to prepare a customized mouth guard, which was helpful to prevent her from another bite injury in the third surgery. Somatosensory rope potentials are gener generated by stimulating the peripheral nerves, and we're recording the responses from the scalp electrodes. So in spine surgeries where the patient is prone, we prefer to uh, stimulate the ulnar nerve to see the whole brachial plexus and the posterior tibial nerve, and we record them from our cock screw electrodes placed on the scalp. Somatosensory rope potentials can monitor the dorsal column, the medial lemniscus pathway, um, which mediates the tactile discrimination, vibration sensation, so conscious proprioception. And we're also able to use the mapping technique uh, at the dorsal columns to identify the neurophysiological midline in intermedullary spinal cord tumors. Um, so these are the advantages of SSCPs. They are very susceptible to inhalational anesthesia and they prefer a TIVA. And uh, provides little or no information regarding motor function and may re remain stable in spinal cord ischemia. And they don't show uh, the spinal thalamic uh, pain temperature pathway. This is the experimental model where red uh, aortic occlusion uh, is done. So spinal cord ischemia, the loss of, after the spinal cord ischemia, the loss of MEPs were after two minutes in group A. And after six minutes in group B was the decline of somatosensory awoke potentials, and it was not even a total loss, um, indicating that motor awoke potentials uh, declined earlier, and we have a pronounced decline. Uh, somatosensory awoke potentials decline lesser uh, later, and uh, the amplitude change is sometimes not very pronounced. This might be because um, there are not enough synap synapses uh, of the dorsal column and the metabolic demand might be lower than the corticospinal tract. We are also mapping, triggering uh, EMG. We identify root and rootlets by stimulating the neural structure and recording the responses at the target muscle. This method is also helpful to identify, and identify if there are some neural structures in the femur terminale before dissecting it. So we stimulate the femur terminale, and if there's no obvious response in the target muscles, um, then we are able to cut it safely. We're using a bipolar stimulation because we don't want that the current spreads and misleads us and misinterpret our uh, responses. Free running EMG is very easy. We're just watching the EMG, the, the muscles uh, reaction to some, the reaction of some surgical irritation. Uh, it doesn't interfere with the surgery, but it's sometimes difficult to interpret if there's really an injury of the nerve or not. So if there's a decline of the motor evoke potentials uh, along with some discharge in the free running EMG, uh, we might give an immediate feedback to the surgical team. This might be something which is important, but we have to keep in mind if the nerve is sharply transected, uh, free running EMG might uh, stay silent and we will, would not recognize if there is a cut of the nerve or not. So when should we warn the surgeon? We want to double check before we warn the surgeon surgical team. We want to be sure that the data loss is really consistent. And we look at the degree of the change, the nature of the change, the length of the time, and of course, if the change is related to the surgical maneuver. And then, of course, we definitely the, alarm the surgeon. Uh, and if there's any risk of the neural tissue, we ask the surgical team to pause, maybe to elevate the blood pressure, to warmly irrigate the area, or um, we also sometimes ask the surgeon to apply some papaverin uh, in, um, in order to uh, enhance the blood flow. So is, is there a deficit? This is always the question to us. Is there a deficit? If the signal loss in this experimental study is longer than one hour, 
the patients may uh, come out with paraplegia. If it's short, if it recovers, then if we have the motor work potentials at the end of the surgery, we can safely say that everything is fine. But if it's gone, if it's gone for a longer while, there might be some important deficit. So the aim should be and not just detect, also to modify the surgical manipulation. And uh, we will uh, tell the surgical team that there's a risk of permanent injury um, if the data gives some alarm, but we can't do everything to prevent or uh, avoid. This is, this is out of the reach of IOM. Can monitoring to predict all deficits risk? There's a risk of overlooking root injuries. There's a risk of potential false alarms, and we have to think about the anesthesia effect. So uh, it's not always easy to um, monitor some cases. We might have false positive, where the surgeon is alerted to a situation and there's no noticeable deficit, no noticeable problem. And we fear of false negatives, where IOM data fail to show any deficits and a serious deficit has occurred, uh, and we have failed. But luckily, the disastrous false negatives are very rare. Here is a prospect study of spine cases of 1,017 patients. 92% uh, of the patients came out with two negative, and 6.5 were two positive. That means there was an eye alarm, and um, the patient had some problems. And there were also false negatives and false positives, but not very high. And, eight cases of the false negatives, seven patients fully recovered, and one patient was with permanent radicular deficit. There are equipmental problems, electrodes problems, anesthesia problems, and blood pressure problems. When the blood pressure drops, uh, and we, we have um, amplitude loss of, most of the time, amplitude loss of the motor work potentials, and that's the same also with body temperature drop. So we try to minimize uh, the problems in the OR. We want to choose appropriate modality. So we want to really monitor at risk nerve tissue, monitor both sides up and lower extremities, avoid high currents to prevent electrical hazards, and set alarm criteria to pre prevent misinterpretation. And we never like to change our routines. Our, uh, we have a team of uh, neurologists and tech technicians and uh, we dislike uh, to change our routine because the more you change your routine, the more um, mistakes you're doing. Uh, so in rare cases, we have to change our routines, then we have to be very careful. And we monitor until the end, until the one closure. There are some electrical interference in the uh, OR which we are dealing, blood warmers, warming blankets, electrocautery, CUSA, surgical microscope, anesthesia workstation, or the OR table. We are usually unplugging the OR table, but and um, the blood warm is also adjustable, but other things like that, it's difficult sometimes to manage. So the IOM team uh, is an important team. The surgeon, of course, is very important, but also there should be a medical doctor in the room to monitor the case, clinical neurophysiologist, anesthesiologist, and uh, monitoring technologist. And the neurophysiologist should be expertizing in clinical neurophysiology and in IOM. Interpret electrophysiological changes due to surgery, reduce artifacts, identify the peak waves, train technologists, and integrate monitoring modalities. With an experienced team with special training in IOM, the spine surgeon can rely on the neurophysiological findings presented by the monitoring experts. Multimodal interpretive neuromonitoring combines different techniques to ensure the safety of the neurologic functions during surgery and contributing to improved patient outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I, uh, um, I think a very nice and impressive overview of interoperative neuromonitoring. Uh, for those who have questions, uh, you can uh, put them in the chat. Um, I already have one question, which is uh, in my personal experience, always difficult. How do you interoperatively, interoperatively neuromonitoring if a patient has a tumor at the craniosophagal area? So at the C0, C1, C2 area, is it difficult for you to, to do the EO&M? 
Um, and if if you do that, uh, what do you do to have a accurate neurophysiology? So we we love to compare during a monitoring, right? We have our data there, and we want to compare before um, a important step of the surgery and after that, and we want to. Uh, compare lower with upper uh, results but, or potentials. So this we should consider as a brainstem and a spine, uh, spinal cord position. So we also try to get uh, lower cranial nerves in the game to see if there are uh, some insults or, of, or effect of anesthesia, for example. If we lose some potentials, is this because of the surgery or is it because of... Um, um, of anesthesia effect or hypothermia or hypotension. So it's already the setup must be that we also uh, involve some cranial nerves. And then the difficulty usually is the patient movement. So we should uh, stimulate in low intensity and still try to evoke some potentials. And uh, if it's um, a tumor in the intermedullary area, we are usually using and the D-wave electrode, which most probably Francesca will mention now in a speech. This is also very helpful to, uh, to follow up the surgery very closely. And uh, we are looking for, we are, we're using the, some center, some of the sensory motor potentials um, to follow up the spine, spinal cord throughout the surgery. Okay, thank you very much. I also have a question on of Fabiano. Uh, Fabianto Santoso from Indonesia. Uh, he's a resident of neurosurgery uh, from the University of Indonesia in Jakarta. And he wants to know what's the functional difference of monopolar versus bipolar stimulation? This is a very good question. Um, bipolar is where the anode and cathode or the reference and the um, the actual stimulate, uh, the stimulator is nearby. So we are very focal. This is good if you want to name a structure like a nerve, and we want to stay very focal with our stimulation. Because if we stimulate higher, we have another, we have other neural structures which we can evoke and misinterpret. If is this this nerve, is it this nerve? Or uh, we have responses from all of the nerves, which one is it? So if you want to stay focal, you use a bipolar stimulation. We are talking about the peripheral uh, stimulation. Yeah. And um, monopolar stimulation is you have a reference electrode nearby um, uh, the surgical area, and you have a larger area to stimulate. This is a method we don't maybe prefer in peripheral surgery because we have that current spread, but you can go still very low and try to evoke that single route what you want. Uh, monopolar stimulation is commonly used in um, uh, to stimulate the cortex or subcortical area, uh, which is very helpful to identify the subcortical cortical spinal tract and the distance to the subcortical uh, tract in brain surgery. So we use commonly monopolar stimulation over there. Okay, thank you very much. And now the last question, uh, who's from um, Jacques Nel. He uh, asked, he asked, he thanks you for the presentation, but we all thank you. Um, and he asks, would you always consider papaverine for all spine cases when there is a loss on the TC map amplitude, or is it case dependent? Let me talk about my approach because there are different different approaches, different dosages, uh, different applications. So if the when I give an alarm, I really ask the surgical team to stop and pause and understand what happens. I try to, of course, before that, I check several times if my loss is consistent. And the first step is not paparine. We are asking to elevate the blood pressure to for the blood supply, irrigate warm, and continue to stimulate. And if the surgeon has to continue, we ask the surgeon to continue in another spot so to modify the surgical maneuver. And still, if the if the uh, potentials don't come back, then I ask Papa Varian. So there are different applications. Some is directly putting the Papa Varian on the surgical field. Uh, some surgeons love to uh, dilute it with some serum physiologic 
or some put it on us um as a gauze and apply it on the feet whatever it is it might work sometimes and doesn't work sometimes so but this is a rescue medication i use occasionally okay thank you very much can i ask something yeah uh, uh, dr elif has uh, nicely uh, presented basics of the monitoring but um uh, Mostly, the monitoring team uh, consists only from an, a technician that the companies are providing. Do you think they are uh, educated or trained well to make this this very difficult job properly? I mean, the technicians. Uh, this is a question. You cannot find me, right? uh, neurophysiologists in the operating room. Like you, uh, so then we have problems in interpretation of the monitoring. That's uh, Dr. Silule. I mentioned at the end of my speech that there must be a medical doctor in the field to interpret the potentials. But we have a problem in Turkey, um, and we try to change the law or the, this way of uh, the approach of the Minister of Health since many years that they have to pay the neurophysiologists uh, in the operating room, not the company. But in Turkey, that's the main problem, that the company is paid and not the neurophysiologist. So we can't invite anyone, especially in the um, in the state's hospitals, in university hospitals. In the private sector, that's not a problem. That's why we evolve in the private sector. And, and doctors, medical doctors are more monitoring in private hospitals. But if you're in a state hospital in Turkey, the neurophysiologist is not paid. And if you ask the patient, uh, the doctor to stay there for eight and 10 hours without any payment, what what will he or she do? Yeah. And so we have to change yeah, right. the way the approach. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very good question, okay. Mehmet. And so we had the same in the past, but we uh, arranged payment of neurophysiologists. So <laughs> with this, I, I conclude this session for uh, Professor Alida. Thank you very much. And now we go to 